Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our virtual fireside chat where we connect with industry leaders on all things mental health and well-being to celebrate this incredible moment in time that's quite difficult for many of us. Uh, and we're so thrilled that you're here to help us yeah, really build mental health and well-being in organisations. For those who don't know me, my name is Tegan Davies and I'm the General Manager of the Oranges Toolkit. And um, for those who would like to engage today, we have the chat function and I've actually already started to see some familiar names. So it's so great to see some familiar names. But John is there in, in our tech support too, if at all you need him. Uh, to speak to John on tech support, basically you head to the chat function, you click on his name and he can respond to you directly. Otherwise, if you have questions or you want to contribute at all, please feel free to do so in the chat because we want to make sure this session is one that is super meaningful for you. Uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that I'm coming from today. Uh, this picture was taken uh, last week about 2Ks from my house. It's the Maroondah Aqueduct or near Plenty Gorge, which is in Greensboro in Victoria. And the traditional owners of this land are the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So for those unfamiliar names that we don't necessarily know much about you, you might not necessarily know much about us at the Oranges Toolkit, but we build mental and emotional agility through what we think are pretty seriously refreshing workplace wellbeing and resilience training programs. Uh, so that ultimately organisations can positively adapt to complexity, change and adversity. And we also just happen to be Camp Quality Social Enterprise, so any profits we make go back to kids facing cancer in Australia. And what we'll do for those who don't know too much about our history or our story, I'll get Angie, our Head of Marketing, to share a link for you if you want to get to know our organisation a little more. So we're talking all things mental health and wellbeing, and I'm just so thrilled to introduce you all to Ali Haplin. Ali is the GM of, or Deputy GM of People and Culture at the Australian Sports Commission. And we've been working with the Sports Commission for a couple of years now. And I can honestly say they are doing something right because every interaction we have with her people are just so rich and enjoyable. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to invite Ali uh, to uh, to the stage, I suppose, and uh, to kick us off today. Hey, Ali, welcome to the camp. Hi, how are you going? Thank you. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. So let's get started because we've only got 27 minutes now to get into yeah. goodness. So tell us a little bit about the ASC, particularly for those who probably aren't familiar with the department. Sure, no worries. So the Australian Sports Commission is a government agency. Um, we're probably better known by our name, the Australian Institute of Sport, um, particularly in the year that we've just had with the Tokyo Olympics and how well we did both at the Olympics and the Paralympics. So it was a really exciting time um, to be working for the organisation. But the Australian Sports Commission, I suppose, is our government name um, and we are the sport arm of government. So we are that um, connection point between what the government's trying to achieve through sport and the sports sector who actually is the delivery arm of sport. And we've got two brands that sit under the Australian Sports Commission, the Australian Institute of Sport or AIS, as, as I said, we are better known for, and they're really focused on high performance sport, um, podium success, and the national pride and inspiration that we get from that. There's also another arm of our um, commission called Sport Australia, and Sport Australia is focused on grassroots sport, um, growing participation, getting more Australians moving more often and engaging engaging in organised sport um, and also building the capability of the sports sector as well um, and ensuring that the sports sector is governed well, um, the workforce is, is maturing, um, they are managing their finance as well, um, leveraging off opportunities to kind of grow as sporting organisations. So it's quite a big remit. Um, and for those that are at the right age group, um, they've probably visited our site, the old Year 6 excursion to Canberra, um, has had the AIS as a, a visiting spot um, for quite some time now. And that's where we're based, on the AIS site. Beautiful. Thank you. And how big is your team in general? 
So the um, the people and culture aspects of my broader branch, we've got around 15 people. I have a, a branch of 50, which has got some different teams in it. Um, specifically, the team that support us with wellbeing is a team of two and a half, mm -hmm. um, and they certainly punch above their weight in terms of supporting the wellbeing of our staff. We're really well supported by our managers and leaders, though, and, and that makes all the difference. Yeah, great. Well, let's get straight into the, the goodness. And I guess our, our community are probably going to, get, going to want to hear a little bit about some of the successes that you've seen in terms of mental health and wellbeing initiatives and what sort of learnings mm. you've had in your past, whether it's at the ASC or other organisations. Yeah, sure. Um, so some of the things that we've been doing, I suppose, have really been driven by COVID. Like mm -hmm. probably many people listening here, you just, you, you COVID just came at you and um, we were all kind of scrambling there for a while to understand how our workforce would respond. And one of the things that became really apparent was that people were struggling. There was so much uncertainty and it was incredibly disruptive. Um, we'd been doing some work with you, as you know, and providing providing um, some resilience and, and well-being um, training for some staff um, and, and trying to build it, I suppose, with a bit of a slow burn, but that wasn't going to work in this environment. Um, we needed we need a lot more and a lot more quickly. So um, one of the first things we did is stand up a wellbeing program that we ran and um, we had up and running, I think probably around a couple of weeks after that first round of COVID hit. Um, and again, that's credit to Orange's Toolkit for turning that around so quickly for us. And one of the great things about that wellbeing program is that you tackled the issue of wellbeing and resilience from some different angles. And I think that really resonated with staff. So whether it was managing fatigue and burnout or cultivating hope and optimism over difficult times or managing managing yourself in change, those slightly different nuances to each of the things that we offered ensured that um, people were, if they didn't see themselves in one, they could kind of see themselves in another. So that was a really, that's been a huge success for us at the Sports Commission. Some other things that we've done, we're a fairly high touch workforce with a lot of personal relationships and people that respond to, um, I suppose, personable initiatives. So we've done things like pastoral care check-ins where we've just um, got names of staff in Melbourne um, first because poor Melbournians and Victorians have been in lockdown for so long. And we divided those names up across the group and went, let's just give them an individual call just in case um, they needed someone from outside of their work group, so not their manager, mm. someone from HR, um, a safe place. Just how are you really going um, and how does it feel for you and is there anything else we could be doing? Um, we also have run sessions um, with cohorts as well, um, Sydney and Melbourne and some, our Canberra cohorts while they've been in lockdown and we've just made them really lighthearted. Managers are doing a great job doing lots of, you know, virtual drinks and, you know, um, bingo and all those kind of things. But this was a chance for our leaders to come online and, and say to our staff, this is really hard. We're finding it really hard as well. Here are some of our stories and lived experiences. And, you know, they're on screen and like the cat's walking across and the kids are like jumping up. So it's really normalising that, that sense that um, it, it's been tough for everyone and um, leader wellbeing right through to everyone in the organisation has taken a bit of a hit and we've needed to be a bit more intentional about it. So that's given staff some real permission to get involved in, in some of the things that we've been offering. And we're really constant with our comms as well. So for people that aren't as forthcoming in terms of jumping onto programs or turning their video on so we can see them when we're doing check-ins, um, we've kept a really steady stream of tips and tricks and things that people can just investigate in their own time time as well if they're looking for some different strategies um, as well so and empowering our managers we've really tried to say to our managers um, you know your your people best so so get involved and ask questions and make adjustments um, that suits them we're not going to come out and say this strategy is going to work for everyone we want you to to curate I suppose what what um, support looks like for your individual staff members. And that's something that we will definitely continue that concept of empowering managers who are close to their staff to pick up on the cues um, and, and to respond to them and, and not to delay in responding to them. So they're just some of the things mm, nice. that have been successful. 
Yeah, and I hear the last sort of few initiatives are ones that don't actually cost any money, right? You know, yeah, right. picking up the phone is just about being a human being and caring yes. and navigating that as, yes. as just another human, let alone as a manager. And I really like yeah. this idea of constant communication, particularly, you know, if we talk about the, the, the science of what we're going through at the moment, when we have lots of change and uncertainty, it can create mm. a fear state in us and our brains don't like that. And so mm. lots of communication and trying to create some certainty for the path ahead is, is really vitally important for the well-being of people mm. because there's just so much change um, on an organisational yeah. level and also outside of work as well. Um, yeah, yeah. And so that's all rosy, all the things that work really well. Um, but I'm sure there's been some road bumps and there has been. You've had to pull yeah. out, excuse the pun. And, and so are there any kind of learnings that you've experienced, particularly over the last couple of years around yeah. what maybe hasn't worked so well? Yeah, no, definitely. So one of the things that um, that I've reflected on is that we were probably a little bit slow to move. Like we were all kind of a bit, you know, scram scrambling when COVID hit, but just probably even more broadly before pre-COVID, um, just in terms of thinking intentionally and planning intentionally about the about well-being and resilience and the role it plays and and how people's personal well-being and resilience plays into a professional context and that they're, they're they're inexplicably linked and and we probably were a little bit we're playing catch up um, but we're probably a little bit late to come to that and this is an organization that it goes through a lot of change so um, up until quite recently like those the Olympic and Commonwealth Games cycles I was speaking about before at the end of each of those cycles would often come a really significant change for the organization now we've we've been going through that for quite some time and not really been as intentional about building resilience and the well-being and thinking through that for, um, perspective for our staff um, and as I said now we're speeding up but that was one of my reflections going we needed to start um, more quickly and when these things happen again we, we shouldn't be in a position where we're standing things up for the first time because we should be maintaining them as a constant um, because this is a part of um, equipping our staff to be the best versions of themselves and for our organisation to be the best version of itself. What's not to love about building the resilience and well-being of, of our people for that purpose? The other thing, um, reflection, the lesson learned learned is that well-being and, and building resilience and well-being has got to be supported with um, with more things so I'll give you a great example and it's a COVID example again um, people were saying we are loving we're loving the support that we're getting from the organization we're loving that you're being really intentional about us building healthy habits um, but my workload isn't changing mm. and I am languishing in a day because you're acknowledging I'm there's some threats to my resilience and well-being, but none of the expectations are changing for my workload. So that really prompted a, a new set of actions for us as an organisation. And we actually moved to, particularly when the schools closed, and we were really alive to the fact that that was providing a lot of pressure on home caring parents. Um, so we moved um, to stand up COVID leave. And what that was, was if, if you are trying to homeschool and home care and work at the same time, we're saying on your behalf, that's impossible. And we are going to give you some hours in the day that you can take as leave to continue to work as much as you can, but just call out when you can't and step away and be a great parent or be a great carer to whoever you need to care for. And that really, um, that supported and really, um, I suppose, accelerated the well-being in our in our workplace as well, because people were going. You're saying that my that resilience and my well-being is important, and now you've done something really tangible to support that even further and to back that in and to make it more than just words. So um, that was something that has been a really powerful thing that we learned that you need to have both. And I think that's probably a broader concept: is you can't just 
say to people, look after your well-being and um, here are some tactics um, to increase your resilience and agility and then um, and then not do anything to support that. Um, so one of the things that I've been talking to leaders and managers about again lately is with all the schools closed and with people saying to okay, take COVID leave for this purpose, you've got to moderate some expectations. They, you cannot expect the same amount from them if they are taking a bit of COVID leave to look after themselves and their family. So these things kind of have all formed a package together um, for us to support our workforce. So yeah, that's been a key learning. I love that example. I love it so much because we see it over and over again. And sometimes, you know, as, as a training organisation, sometimes we're just inoculating staff against just hard times. Mm. And I can see that job design is going to be more important than ever because mm. what you're doing there is you're, you know, tweaking people's roles and saying you do what you have to. You have that autonomy to choose mm. when and where and how you work and we and we recognize yeah. that and i think you know we know that burnout is absolutely on the rise um and most organizations are doing great things but the workload has still increased everything is harder yeah. Um, yeah. everything is harder remotely and also during COVID. and and i just yeah. love that you've put that initiative in place yeah um, just another thing i just yeah. an appendix to that is one of the other challenges i would say is Encouraging people, particularly high performers, for those on the call, we've all got them, giving themselves permission mm. to find a new normal that is a match for where they're at. And I've had quite a few conversations with, with different staff across from the commission going, the organisation is giving you permission. So to the, to the very top of the organisational tree, they are saying, we want you to look after yourself. We don't want you to burn out. Please take COVID leave. So interestingly, not everyone took COVID leave at first. Mm -hmm. They were like, maybe that's not for me. We had to promote people taking COVID leave um, to help manage, you know, their, their well-being and their family. So there is this, this inner sense within people and it's the very thing we love as employers that you're so committed and dedicated to your work. Um, but we had to start to have some different conversations with some individuals around you are really important to us and you we love your dedication and your commitment but you're not going to be able to do that if you're unwell or you're so depleted so please you've got permission give yourself permission um, to do that and that's a personal journey and you can't do that for someone but by even using that language um, it, it did make some people stop and reflect going oh actually I, I, I'm my own worst enemy here um, and, and gave us an opportunity to talk through what that might look like for them. Yeah, and it definitely has to be top down, right? If if none of your leaders are taking COVID leave themselves yes. and shouting it out to the world, like I'm taking COVID leave, it's okay. Yes. You're never going to get that buy-in from the from from people down below because they, it's not normalised. Yeah. Um, I'd love to encourage everyone. We've got a, you know about 12 minutes to go, so if you have any questions at all, please um, send them through in the chat and, and we can try to answer them. Um, in fact, we actually have a comment here from Jenny. Uh, I'd like to comment that managers taking the cues from the team around them, absolutely. Uh, what suggestions would you have for managers that may not be picking up on the cues of their team members? Um, yeah, how, what would you, what yeah. would you tell them? Thanks, Jenny. I actually question. think proactive, great question, Jenny. I actually think proactive training is the key. I don't think that naturally, I think, look, I think some people do naturally can pick up on the cues and others want to, but but possibly don't know how. It's absolutely a learned thing. So um, I would be encouraging to be really proactive in your, in your strategy, starting at the manager level, um, doing something like Orange's Toolkit for them to understand, even putting some language around it for them to understand um, what kind of things they can ask, um, what are some kind of really great questions, how they could frame that. Um, and then I would also say starting to talk about it in your team meetings with your managers and saying what you could brainstorm it together. What kind of things could we be asking or what are you asking your team and, and how has that worked for you? And 
um, and, and trying those things within your own team. So one of the, the key things in this space is actually just starting. It's it's starting to talk about it. It's starting to, you know, even if you have to start with a formal agenda item that we're going to talk about this at every single meeting, it's like a muscle. You'll strengthen it. It will become a habit. But starting is important. I think training is important so managers feel really equipped and confident to ask questions and then just sharing with your peers to see what's working for them. Um, that's one of the, the the greatest ways I've learned um, about how to support the workforce is listening, one, to the workforce, because if you ask them, they'll tell you, um, <laughs> particularly if they feel like it's a safe place. Um, and secondly, just asking what others are doing and or others sharing what they're doing and going, that's a great idea. Um, you know, let's 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 start doing that. I heard of um, one organisation that was was talking every single meeting about a highlight and a low light, mm. and the highlight was fantastic because that was a chance to celebrate and laugh. But they asked about the low light as well because it brought a different kind of anecdote and it gave them a different kind of sense of what was going on in the life of their team. I'm like, great idea. Mm. Um, I'll, I'll try that one. I'll take that one. So. Um, starting conversations about it uh, will grow the capability of the people around you. Oh, I love that. I mean, you, you, you touched on just before that last comment around if people will come to you if it's a safe place and that question around highlight, great, it's great to speak about the positive things, but we know that we can sometimes focus too heavily on the positive things and we may end up creating toxic positivity if we're not too worried, mm -hmm. if we're not, you know, too... Yeah too careful of it and that this idea of normalizing struggle and normalizing the fact that yes we have low lives low lines or low opportunities gosh if I can even speak by this fireside today um I think is really valuable for people to share and, and normalize that struggle um I notice I have oh, Mark Chins made a comment one of your team members not a question a comment when working from home it is important for leaders to leave loudly I love that Mark uh, and to sig signal to their team that it's okay to take a break and finish early. I think you just tried to send that to me, Mark. Um, good news is you didn't say any swear words or, or anything, so that was always good. Um, and it's true, Mark. And, in fact, I've told my team that uh, at 2 o'clock today I'm scooting off early because I've, I've worked a few hours. Mental health month's a pretty big one for us, and we're only eight days in. So, um, yeah, thank you very much for sharing that. And I think we have... Um, Oh, I love this. Alison or Alison, I'm, I'm, I hope I've pronounced that correctly, um, uses a traffic light system at work. Uh, and that means um, that people don't have to share all the details. Oh, that's brilliant. Again, that is great, Alison, isn't it? Creating a safe place um, for people mm. to share or not to share, I think, is, is really valuable. Um, Ali, if you were to rewind two years ago, and normally people ask you, what would you tell your 18-year-old self? Um, but oh, let's, just go, <laughs> let's just go two years ago. What would you tell your two-year uh, two ago self in terms of what you've learned in the last two years? Um, I think from an organisational point of view, I think I would tell myself, um, in terms of my organisational leadership role, I would tell myself, lean into this, lean into supporting your staff hard um, because the unintended consequence is this, this increased trust between um, the organisation and your workforce, this, this, this galvanising of um, relationships and even the more formal relationship of employer to em employee has just galvanised in a new and more trusting way. So, so lean in, go hard, keep your foot on it, um, don't, don't take it off um, because we are, not only do we have, I suppose, the sense that by and large, and we, and we don't know what we don't know, but by and large, our people have felt supported. We have come out stronger as a workforce um, as a result and as an organisational as a result. So the organisational learning has been really significant and the workforces have come along with us um, and come, and I suppose, and, and, and consumed what we've offered and given us feedback on what we've offered so we can actually make it even better. And through that entire process, we've galvanised. Mm. Um, 
which is fantastic. So that's what I would say to from an organisational leadership point of view. From a personal point of view, I would say to myself, don't underestimate habits. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I was saying to a, a colleague the other day who I wasn't quite I wasn't quite sure they rated well-being habits or, or talking about this and I was kind of bringing this into the conversation and saying sometimes people think they're above this stuff I don't need habits well-being <laughs> habits are just for the people that aren't copers and I said I would I would say that I would probably rate myself as someone who copes and is quite resilient and I've been really challenged and confronted mm -hmm. about the effectiveness of my own personal strategies and I and and you slip so, you know, um, you, you, you start strong and then suddenly you, you're slipping and, you, and you're doing things like emails at, at the wrong times or skipping that walk or, you know, not having, um, you, not having that, that, that step outside when you need to or whatever it is. We're, we're not great at maintaining our own well-being. So, so my reflection to myself is be intentional, be serious about your habits no one is above um no one's above needing to learn new habits and strategies and no one is above needing um the discipline to maintain them um we all need them and it's a great thing to talk about them um, and and to seek help to hold you accountable to them that is so good and i totally resonate and i'm sure many people who have dialed in today are resonating around how quickly it is to slip out of those habits that we know are really good for us and then we just eat a little bit unhealthier and then Friday night drinks ends up being Wednesday night drinks, which ends up being Monday night drinks. And it's just so, so easy to slip. Ali, when you were talking about um, the power of habits for, for anyone who wants an extra resource, and I'm not sure if you've read this book, but Atomic Habits by James Clear, so good. It's so good because it sometimes when we think about well-being, we think it's really big and really hard and difficult. But actually, James kind of, you know, helps us empower ourselves by just thinking smallly about habits, like these tiny little things that happen every day and those small micro moments are the ones that actually can impact us greater than we realize because they kind of compound. So um, James Clear, Atomic Habits for, um, for those who are interested. In fact, Angie, would you mind quickly Googling that and sharing that link for those? Um, who, oh, good on you, Angie. Well Look at her go um, for, for that book. Ali, I, I have one more question for you. My question is, which one do I want to ask? Actually, I've got quite a few. So the, actually, I will ask you this one. So as part of our mental health month, our team are sharing some of our favorite questions that we like to ask ourselves when we think about health and well-being. So which question would you like or often ask yourself or others around you in terms of health and well-being? Mm. So I don't know if this is um, something that I've often been doing, but it's my question I'm doing at the moment. And it is, am I, am I doing what I know works mm. to, to keep me well? So, you know, am I, am I walking the talk? Mm. Um, and I think that is probably I'm asking that question because I'm not. So it's a useful question to ask because I'm in one of those slip moments where I'm going, oh, it's a vortex. I can feel myself. So I've started to ask myself that question um, a little bit more lately um, because I feel like I need to be asking myself that question to be more intentional again. Um, as I said, our habits without nurturing um that they, they, they're sneaky, they, they become diluted. And, and to your point, it's a bit of a slippery slope. And so I, at the moment, my question is, I, am I doing it, what I know to be true? Um, and I'm now asking myself that question every day to ensure yeah. that I, I'm getting better each day. And I've seen improvement this well week done. since I've been asking this myself this question. Very cool. And look, I'm sure our, um, Angie's going to share that on our social media pages because I think it's a really valuable question to ask ourselves. I actually do have one more because we're by the fireside. Are you a toasted marshmallow person or a non-toasted fresh marshmallow person? Oh, my gosh. But this, what happens this is the most I'm important like, one of the day. What if I'm like a lolly person, like across the board? So I think... 
I think I'm a toasted marshmallow person. Okay, that's good to know. Is there some kind of psychological assessment <laughs> of what that, you know, do I crash and burn? <laughs> You just psychoanalyzed yourself. It wasn't I'm molten me. on the inside. There's so many ways, <laughs> so many places we could take this metaphor. <laughs> so very true. Well, look, Ali, thank you so very much for sharing your wisdom with our community today, uh, particularly during this really, really difficult time in in our history, really. Um, for those who don't know, we have a couple of other firesides, well, actually three other firesides coming up. We have Anna Jelamanovic from Mida 10. We have Jim Frith from Connell Dow and Craig Murphy, the GM of Customer People and Culture coming up over the next uh, three weeks. And if you haven't already registered for them, uh, simply use the QR code on the right-hand side if you'd like to register for one of those firesides or also on the left-hand side, if you'd like to follow us on social media as well. Uh, and last but not least, thank you everyone for dialing in. As I mentioned at the start, um, we are at Camp Quality Social Enterprise. So when you choose to support your wellbeing with the Oranges Toolkit, you're also helping kids facing cancer in Australia. Ali, thank you very much again for your wisdom. And I'm going to go toast up some marshmallows. Hmm? Thanks, everyone. Take care. Have a great afternoon.